in your handbooks, there is a very detailed description of Gayatri Chattrovati Spivak's working life. And I don't want to repeat any of that information, and she will be familiar to many people in the audience. Alongside Edward Said and Homi Baba, Gayatri Spivak is one of the great architects of post-colonial studies, as well as one of the great critics of it. She combines that with being a public intellectual and being an activist. She works on early education for the children of landless laborers in India. Terry Eagleton, who is no fan of post-colonial studies, has said she has probably done more long-time political good in pioneering feminism and post-colonial studies than almost any of her theoretical colleagues. And he also said she has a keen nose for Western cant, patronage, and hypocrisy. Prolific and eclectic, greatly honored for her scholarship, she's known to a very wide glo global audience, way beyond the academy, for an essay, Can the Subaltern Speak?, which is on the interests that are at play in the production of knowledge and the conformity that is necessary, forced on subaltern people who try to define and assert their identity. Today, she will speak for the Rohingya, speak about genocide, and tell us what she thinks is to be done. Please give a big welcome to Professor Spivak. It is a great honor to be here. I said that I would give witness rather than, because to this crowd, I cannot bring anything that would be new. What I wanted to say in uh, the time that I have, what I wanted to say was that there is a different way called for now because I quite agree about, about the fact that there is no contradiction between the legal and the social scientific approach to genocide. But there is something when you actually, I'm a, I'm a humanities person, I'm a useless and impractical person, but don't think that what I'm saying here is impractical because ultimately we are thinking about the people there, right? We are not thinking about what research is good, etc. By the way, Zarni, I'm 100% with you about Orientalism, about Buddhism, because I'm going to talk about that. I'm an Indian and how orientalized Buddhism is for us. And so I'll come to that. But my basic point is that it is not the impractical humanities person who reminds you that, in fact, whatever you do with the law, enforcement, even successful enforcement, and shaming, which is Human Rights Watch, shaming and enforcement will not finally bring a just world. It will only breed more uh, opposition, stronger opposition. If I may uh, quote someone, it is just that there be law, but law is not justice. And some of us have, have to think of that. This is why I said I would give witness from my own experience. For the last 30 years, my very minor activism is outside of the academy because as you said, I teach uh, uh, at Columbia and I'm kicked upstairs, uh, made useless by uh, as much of honor, as much honor that Columbia can give. A university professorship at Columbia makes you basically useless. So uh, there I am uh, fixed, teaching, trying to change minds. But the other side, on the other side, I've been teaching exactly with the same principles, not something else. In these six schools for 30 years, training teachers, teaching the children, and I will tell you something, they do not have education for their children if there is no education. Even with a primary school system there, those landless illiterate who have been, remember, I have a right to give witness here because I was laughing with Chopin when I heard of the Hindus keeping their heads down and saying they're Muslims. I'm a caste Hindu. If you want a record of oppression, 
I think we pretty much hold the union ticket. It's a millennial kind of oppression, and these people that I teach, they're the ones whom we de uh, deprived of the understanding even of intellectual right, right to intellectual labor. So to an extent, the idea, and they vote, and they vote. It's the largest sector of the electorate in supposedly, if CNN is to be believed, the world's largest democracy. Hmm? And one knows very, very well that they are in fact taken in because there's, I tell them that, because they're so uneducated and they are completely, completely ready to be materially bribed, bribed, as you said, bribe culture and rape culture is taken as normal by the ones who enforce the law, the police, because I see at the class apartheid of education. So therefore, just law, whether it is uh, social scientific or legal, that is not finally the problem, and this is not something impractical I'm saying. So therefore, it seems to me that for me, the only thing I can do here is to give witness here, is printout of digital information about the Rohingyas that I have, okay? My, uh, my assistant uh, said, print everything out. Thought I was crazy. The, in spite of this, people actually don't even read to the end. People don't read to the end of these insertions, okay? So it's good that this should happen. It's good that information should go out. But in our information overload age, information finally does not do anything much. I'll tell you what I think. I think that what we need to do now, and that's what's written on the thing, what we need to do now, I mean, what is the basic, excuse me for speaking in this very rude way, but I am in fact Indian. You see that? I just voted, this is vote color. This last week I voted for the West Bengal Legislative <coughs> Assembly elections. I have a 55 year old green card. I'm not an American. I speak as, of course, I, I have thousands of American students, I love them, but that's a very different thing. So basically, what does one see? That this kind of so-called uh, work is located in identity groups, except for the Euro-US folks. They can save the whole world. But as far as we are concerned, each group is focused on our identity. We live in a global world. What we need to do, apart from everything else, everything that's being done should be done. I'm not a naysayer. I think information is good. I think research is good. I think information retrieval is good. I think conferences are good. Although, I'm going to Rwanda, right from here, for the World Economic Forum, unmediated digitizing of Africa. I have something to say there in exactly the same way. But you will see how the rooms are filled. It's the World Economic Forum. But nonetheless, the, this kind of wanton expenditure of meetings and so on and so forth, in the long run, you know what is the saddest thing? Since I've been teaching in these schools, I live with people who have as little as these people do. With their, with the saddest thing is, in some of these photographs, you'll see a boy kid smiling. Accepting wretchedness as normal, accepting rape culture and, uh, and uh, bribe culture as normal, Unless some of us are engaged in changing that, nothing will change. Law is not justice. It is just that there be law. Law is not justice. And we have to become global. The, I, by we, that's why I'm giving witness. By we, I mean we who are not Euro-US. God knows I'm almost an honorary US, although I don't have a citizenship or no civil rights there. But nonetheless, I would say, therefore, I can speak both ways, because uh, since I vote in India, I would lose my US citizenship. If I took out a double citizenship, I wouldn't take it out anyway, but there you are. So therefore, what I'm trying to say to those of us who are identity group activists here, you know, we the Rohingyas, or we the Rohingyas and Cambodians, and so on and so forth, let us now be as global as our, you know, that's what Fano said, that after colonialism, the, the colonized who were militant, they're going to hold hands with the good whites. You know, that, that's, in the, that's, in, that's in the, what you call it, that's in The Wretched of the Earth, a book written in the last 10 weeks of this 36-year-old man's life, 
when he knew that he was dying of acute leukemia. This is the advice he gave us, that we ourselves, and he wrote about the failure of Pan-Africanism, and what we are talking about now, I mean, this young guy, wild boy from Martinique, he began by fighting for the free French. Nobody understands that in the beginning, uh, fought for the French. In 1944, he wrote, for the first time he goes to Algeria fighting for the French for the gold. He wrote, wrote uh, the French hate the Jews. Derrida is in Algeria at that point, 1944. The French hate the Jews. The Jews hate the Arabs, and the Arabs hate the niggers. I'm a nigger, and I can't get through to, I can't get through to the general population. Let us, identitarian activists, I for India, because the country is losing its democratic base, you for the Rohingyas, and perhaps a little more, and so on and so forth, the Palestinian Israeli ones, just for Israel. Let us move beyond this. This thing, in fact, brings big questions, like the, uh, the ed one editorial out of this whole thing, a New York Times editorial, wonderful. But I live in the United States. What do people who really want to harm think about the New York Times, the, the liberal newspaper? I mean, the farce that is the US elections that's going on now. You think people are heeding the New York Times a great deal? No. So therefore, I mean, the New York Times has talked about Hillary Clinton's uh, commitment to Wall Street, etc. also. You think people are paying any attention, forget Donald Trump. But at any rate, so therefore, what I would say, you know, with all of this stuff, if you go to the end, one of these editorials says this. Okay, um, uh, she used, you see, I can't stand free for too long. She used a, uh, an ugly um, move and saying that, I mean, this is the description of genocide that they're giving, ugly move. Huh? saying that the word Rohingya should not be used to describe these people. And then, who reads these things down, to, except an old humanities professor, down to the end? What does she say? She says, this is, of course, going to alarm pure Western human rights people. You know, like us, this Oxford, pure Western, whether, whatever color, you know, we are hyphenated, we, we teach at Oxford, we live in London, and so on and so forth. This is going to alarm the pure Western human rights people. But, and now he gives us advice, and this is why, Penny, I liked very much what you said about we can't wait. Remember, as we have marched since we were young, what do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now, now exactly. So, the, and law is not justice. So, therefore, he says, just wait a bit. Just wait a bit in order to establish in order to establish democracy, the leaders have to do certain kinds of ugly things and please the majority. And then they're showing an example of Andrew Jackson to show that the US, after all, did this 200 years ago, but they implicitly highly racist. But now, you know, these countries have to do these bad deals with the majority in order to establish democracy. What does that word democracy mean in that editorial? And if you go to Piketty, who's a very Eurocentric book, totally Eurocentric book, what does he say? He says that if in the US income uh, d d difference goes up, goes up so that the whole top 10% is getting 90%, I quote, there will be a revolution. So what happened to US democracy? so that here Aung San Suu Kyi has to please the majority and please have some sympathy with her. She's a good leader. She has to establish democracy. And then we'll see everything will go very fine. This is nonsense. So therefore, we who are the pure white, not white, sorry, pure Western, I mean, not white, not white, as old homie said, living in the West, academics, pure Western uh, human rights people, we are a little bit offended. But hey, for the building of democracy, these kinds of things need to be done. That's basically the view. So therefore, what I'm suggesting is we ask, we feminists ask the question, what do women do to hold on to power? And Aung San Suu Kyi is not the only example. Let us generalize these questions. Let us generalize these questions. We who work on genocide, 
You know, I was born in 1942. Now, what kind of time? I was born in 1942. Yeah? Now, I don't even know when technically the famine began. 43. 43, there you are. Like genocide, famine has to be established legally that this was famine, right? Now, I broke my, and you know, my spine, you see that. But uh, I broke my uh, bone in my leg. I went to California, not an Indian doctor, a sports doctor. He opens the, his WHO book. He said, born where, when? Calcutta, 1942, the year of Quit India. But at any rate, he says to me, he says to me, ah, bad bones. Because in terms of the World Health Organization analysis, the famine might have legally been defined as beginning, like, like Armenians, yes, genocide, no genocide. Good, genocide should be established. But what ultimately does it do? Like I say, you know, people, I mean, my country is now almost genocidal. I can't say it, because legally it hasn't been established. You can't call the prime minister genocidal. You know, because, so therefore, it's something that we say in order to work so that the basis of our country, the largest sector of the electorate, develop democratic judgment to vote right. That's, that's my work. That's the only activist work that I've been doing for the last 30 years. And you have to be focused. You can't produce statistics there saying, I've made three million people literate. Literacy and numeracy by themselves are nothing. They're good instruments, but by themselves they're nothing. You should want the same quality for their children's education as for your own. Otherwise, you're in bad faith. So whatever the hell informal thing they have, is not what we are talking about. So the doctor says, okay, it's bad bones. Why? Because not only was um, the, in the artificial famine food hoarded for the uh, American, the US and uh, British soldiers in the Pacific theater, we had ration cards. We mi middle class uh, family certainly ate uh, twice a day. And we had ration cards. But the food that was given out in rations was so inferior that middle-class children grew up malnourished. The World Health Organization knows this and has a handbook, like your genocide handbook. All right, so genocide is in a handbook. Very nice, should be, should be. Remember, I'm not against research. I love the academy. I have been, this is my 51st year of full-time teaching at a university. I'm not in bad faith. I think the academy can be made a good place. But if we believe that that, to come back to the point that I was making, that that really changes so that the, uh, the situation of this, these people, the people will change by enforcement. You've got a vain hope coming. Because and for, this is what I say to my friend, Joseph Stiglitz, who's my, my, uh, my colleague. See, the wonderful man, wonderful man, and, the, and certainly much more learned than I could ever hope to be. But as he's writing his books one by one, finally, because nothing is happening, enforcement becomes more important. And I say, Joe, sorry, en enforcement is good, but we have to think beyond that because that's not going to bring a just world into being. Maybe we should acknowledge that the long-term implementation of a just world will not be in our lifetime. But to be able to state that problem and work for it is better than to pretend the problem doesn't exist and just legal change is going to be enough or just establishing the definition of genocide is going to be enough. Or to give information more and more and more and more and more will be enough because that is not working anymore. When I said this about Palestine the day my friend Asya Jabbar died, Joseph, uh, what is his name? Uh, uh, the guy, the, the Palestinian who was denied tenure. Uh, how can I forget his name? Anyway, uh, what? Anyway, he, Joseph Massad. He writes me a very angry email accusing me of cowardice and racism because I had said after Asiya died that all of this that we do against the Israeli, um, Israeli exploitation and criminal behavior towards state leg legalized violence, all of this that we do, that, that it, nothing works. I had said in mourning, and the occupying uh, Occupy Wall Street guy, Amin Hussein, to whom I had written this private email, he put it public. And then Joseph Massad writes me, you coward, you uh, anti, you uh, pro-Israeli American, and so on and so forth. So uh, let us not dismiss this, what I'm trying to say. 
to acknowledge, to be able to state the problem in terms of the people that law and acknowledgement of genocide and sufficiently clear information, social scientific information, statistical information, is something that we must do, but it stops. It stops the entire last week. I have been talking to uh, people about what? Economic growth and social exclusion, right? And to whom have I been talking? the head of the TUAC, the trade union uh, thing of the OECD, wonderful man, John Evans. And what question did he ask me? What, in your view, is the worst problem? And what answer did I give him? I said, the distance between those of us who can go below and the actual below. Mm -hmm. And locally, in fact, quite often, there's nothing but contempt, even the good, good ones. And, I, and the, what was the problem there? The problem was economic growth and social exclusion. And my country is exploiting the Rakhine area right now. India is good. India is good. And, so the, and then when I went to talk to SIDA, Sweden, right? According to Piketty, one of the best European countries. And I was talking to the chief executive officer of SIDA. And this is the uh, Africa thing. Eh? I mentioned that I, before Rwanda, I was going to go uh, and talk about the Rohingyas. She didn't know who they were. You see all that information? Doesn't cross her desk. She didn't know who they were. This is a woman with power, one of the big government donor organizations of one of the best European countries. Therefore, it seems to me that those of us who are here, what we should do is, it is our obligation in every political public utterance that we manage, all of us here, all of us, to include a mention of this unacceptable crime, tolerated by this so-called pro-democracy activist as she is still described. And excuses, got to do some bad deals with the majority in order to establish democracy, which is a, basically a very criminal point of view. With hindsight, it now seems that as long as she was working in her own interest, heroic in her house arrest, she spoke pro-democracy. Once released, she cannot walk the talk she had uttered because she was anxious to secure power, and now that she has secured it as almost prime ministerial power, she's, uh, we don't hear that final talk. It's got nothing to do with democracy. I, I understand this also. If I'm talking to you folks, saying expand your identitarian work and be global, uh, not the Euro-US, but us. In the same way, we won't be taken seriously. We'll just be, we, we'll just be tolerated, and it, I call it feudality without feudalism. You see, that's Fano's friends, the good whites. So therefore, what we need, and even I was having a conversation with, uh, yes, with um, Nicola. And I was saying, you know, some of us, whatever color, we go in there, we are doing mobile schools, and we are doing this and that. You know, the question like, do they have informal education? We believe that to be equal is to be the same, that all these years of cognitive damage has somehow kept them as a very Christian belief. Neither you nor I is Abrahamic. The uh, belief that somehow suffering has made them pure. And so they really know what they should want, and that's bullshit. If you work with them, you see that that is not the case. If you work with them and you tell them, as I do, I am your enemy, I am your enemy, because I may be good, my parents might have been good, but thousands of years of bringing you up for manual labor, which is what we have done, are not undone by two generations. So try to work without me. Whatever the state is giving you, it's because I'm here. They won't give you if I depart. So try to do without me. So to that extent, I, I'm giving the same message here. So I would say that you know she will not risk it to go against the ethnic Buddhists in power and compromise her own position. Therefore, she tolerates and therefore, in fact, propagates violence against all other ethnic groups, the worst case being the Rohingyas. Let me ask you, it is Rohingya, eh? When I was working in Bangladesh in the 80s, and you know, they were swimming the Naf River, uh, and I, we were in Teknaf, we used to call them Rohingyas. That's not correct. Rohingya is correct. Okay, I learned something. But you know, and when you, that's also giving witness. That was my first involvement when Bangladesh was allowing them to come in, okay? And if they had not crossed the Naf River halfway, because that's the end of the Burmese border, they were taken off. 
And if they could, they came. And there again one saw what it was to educate. I mean, these were people whose cognitive mechanisms, the mechanism with which they know, has been completely damaged, completely destroyed. So it's not a question of the upper class Rohingyas in Britain. One has to be able to understand. You know, this is what I was saying, Nicola, about your Bur uh, Burmese uh, American friend. You have to understand that to be equal is not to be the same. They have to understand that there is class that we, in fact, across the border in Bangladesh itself, a Hindu a tailor or something was hatcheted to death. Across the border in India, a few miles from my sister's house in New Delhi in the capital city, a Muslim was lynched because he might have had, uh, might have had beef in his possession. So this is, a, I quite agree with you, no religion is, uh, is free there, okay. I have five minutes. Five minutes yeah. huh? What? Five minutes, see, I know that, I mean, I'm, I keep other people's time. So therefore, uh, the, the, I listened to Aung San Suu Kyi at Columbia University giving something like a Sunday school sermon, saying she wanted to talk to young people. She mentioned there that she thought of her father when she saw someone in a military uniform, thus sentimentalizing her support of the military. Now, this kind of thing to, the, to children is nonsense. Of, in fact, of course, Myanmar will be no more than a neo-patrimonial state using so-called democratic structures, using so-called democratic structures to allow the economy to be restructured so that the state budget can be continuous with the so-called global budget and the stakes become managerial of capital moving the globe, ethnic oppression, exclusion from citizenship, voting rights, in fact, real democracy will not matter if the name Rohingya is obliterated from human rec recognition. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind with the opening of the stock exchange in Myanmar, that if we can talk like this and in this room, everybody feels so fine and so good and really full of passion, etc. It won't work at all. Okay, the last thing that I'll say in the two minutes that are left, I brought some pictures, but I don't think I should show them. And if I have the thing, like, where, where's my little notebook? Do you see my little notebook there? No, okay. The shop is my notebook there? You know, okay, okay notebook, notebook. I found it. This is how I write. I'm just going to say something about Buddhism. See, the Orientalist view of Buddhism, which is why I also am very moved by this. See, we think of Buddhism as, you know, I was born in 47, 42, right? And I've said in um, Washington and elsewhere, that national liberations are not revolutions. And most national liberations are brought in by what Lenin called the progressive bourgeoisie to orientalist pictures of their countries. The Senghar, the Césaire was a little bit different because Martinique is small, but, and, and certainly Gandhi and Nehru discovering India. And so, and you know, it, to that extent, orientalism can become an instrument. Okay, so we learned that on our flag, the white between Hindu saffron and green Islam was Buddhism, which represented secularism. Ashok is right in the middle, Ashoka Chakra, the emperor, Buddhist emperor Ashoka, who became from a horrible Hindu man to, I mean, the emperor who wanted conquest to a peaceful Buddhist guy who really constructed Dhamma Chakra, Chakra Prabhatana, et cetera, et cetera. So for us, that's what it was, okay? And so uh, uh, Ambedkar, our wonderful Dalit constitutionalist becoming a Buddhist, the elder Kosambi becoming a Buddhist because our kind of Hinduism was destroyed by Prince Siddhartha Gautama. That is our Orientalist picture of Buddhism, okay? And then in my own, in my one minute now, in my, I will take one extra minute like Zarni. In my own, <laughs> in my own, in my own, own culture, Rabindranath Tagore, who doesn't know him? His thing, his play, Chandalika, eh? Jaludha, Jaludha, you know, this, uh, this uh, Buddhist monk, give me some water, give me some water. And there's this woman going with water, and she can't give it to him because she's low caste. And then, of course, Buddhism comes forward and says, no, nothing, come on. And he drinks water. Eh? So this, this, this whole Buddhism thing. And then, and you know, we were not... Uh, 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 sustain enough as young Indians to know that already in Japan Buddhism was an allegory of imperialism and so on. So what we knew then to see Sri Lanka, 
to see Myanmar, to see Thailand. Again, we have to make these connections. Okay, so it is therefore our absolutely imperative task to bring the condition of the non-Buddhist ethnic minorities in Burma in the forefront of the world's problems with Palestine, with Syria, with Iraq, with the disappearance of academic freedom and secularism in my own country, with the tremendous ethnic conflict in many African nations. It must also be placed within the general crisis of the movement of peoples in the world. There is absolutely no excuse for ignoring this phenomenon of genocidal denial of democratic rights, but it must not be kept confined as, it's not even hosted by a Southeast Asia. We South Asians, we are doing this work with Nepal now. We do, they asked me, because Ashish Nandi and Suzy Tharu couldn't give them any help, as to how can South Asia studies stop being Indocentric? You know what I mean? So therefore, the, this, there is no excuse. And since simply taking the opportunity of digital, digital circulation of information not, is not enough, with the overload of information on the World Wide Web. There has to be a greater engagement in order that we may help the cause of social justice whenever we speak in public. Bring this in, arrange it in term, into global examples so that it becomes known by people, not just specific, a specific type, that should not stop. Statistics are available, they can be daily multiplied, yet because digital publicity has become so overloaded, we need to make the statistics come alive, go back to the old ways of becoming permanent persuaders. I quote Antonio Gramsci, becoming permanent new intellectual, must be permanent persuader. Permanent persuaders in one-on-one -on -one and collective discourse rather than depend on the trustworthiness of digital circulation. When Mang Zarni asked me to come and speak to you, I agreed not because I had any new statistics or a greater knowledge of the background or the history. I wanted to give witness. I'm an Indian Bengali, and therefore I know how ridiculous it was to call the Rohingyas Bengalis. And there is another Bengali there to whom I'm speaking in my mother tongue, but he ain't Indian, right? So you're not Indian, kiddo. So that's what I'm saying. The, and that is where I will end, asking all of us to give witness, all of us, not just me, all of us to give witness and continue to give witness. It's very different from giving information. Information is not enough. Right to information is not enough. We must develop our giving witness in accordance with the other side so that responses really come. That's called responsibility. Information is nothing. It's cathartic, as Aristotle would say. It makes you feel good. But that ain't it. So, that is where I will end, asking all of us to give witness and continue to give witness as publicly as possible until this genocide stops. So uh, there is very, very much more to say, and I didn't show the picture of my, my, uh, great, my grandfather. On the one side was my grandfather, who looked like a Muslim, right? He's a Maimon Shing, right? I think of myself as my, my father as Maimonides, because that's Maimon Shah. So my father was Maimon's son, right? So Maimonides, remember the great uh, Jewish philosopher who was for Islam. So he looked like a Muslim, okay? Take off his dhuti and his thing, his sacred thread. And there was a big babu, and there was like real prejudice. I had a picture of my mother's side, Bengal Renaissance, okay? Constitutional convention, everything. My great-grandfather, my great-grandmother, and the three sons, fat cats, wearing suits. Mm -hmm. the, and they had real prejudice against my father's father, except not described as prejudice, but making benevolent fun, you know, of behind my side. And so what I mean? I didn't show you that. I've spared you something. But remember, giving witness, including the Rohingya example in the global example of economic growth, social exclusion, and genocidal behavior within so-called democracy, not just in the global south, but everywhere. That's what we need to do one-on-one, -on -one permanently persuading to supplement all of this stuff because it is just that there be law, but law is not justice.